Thank you. I appreciate your being here tonight. I know we sometimes like the lower, the more closely knit group over in the other building, but I uh, appreciate the fact you're willing to spread out a little bit more tonight uh, with the challenges we're all facing. Trust you're looking forward to our entire Bible conference, not just tonight, but as we look forward to the rest of this weekend. Uh, I've been working on this particular subject. I always like to take something to do something new that perhaps I've not covered before because I enjoy the study, I enjoy the organization, I enjoy the getting back into God's Word and studying something out for myself so that if nobody else is blessed, at least I am. Uh, although I mention the silence of God occasionally, it will come up in a variety of different messages. Uh, you might see it in something on the trials of life. I might mention it there. I have some of the references I've used in other messages, but I've never really taken two complete sessions, approximately an hour and a half worth of material. Well, actually, I have about 10 hours worth of material, but I've tried to narrow down to an hour and a half so you'll get a break between session one and two. The subject grabbed my attention several years ago when I realized how many Old Testament and New Testament saints faced a time in their life where, in spite of the fact they were going through one of the most difficult trials they'd ever faced, they felt that God was distant. Now, if you've never had that experience, praise the Lord, then you don't need this message, but you'll just take the notes or get the two handouts. I think one is six pages, the other one is about the same length. And just hold on to it, and maybe sometime in the future you will find what I have found occurs to a lot of individuals, both Bible characters, as we'll see tonight, as well as individuals that are living at this present time. Now, when you mention that you're going to speak on the silence of God, and I've had several people ask me, oh, a week or so ago, what are you going to speak on? And I said, the silence of God. There, you can tell the wheels start turning. What does that mean? For some, they suggest that, that I'm going to refer to a book that was written by Sir Robert Anderson called The Silence of God. In that book, he attempts to discuss the issue of the fact that we have no more miracles since the first century, that is, in the form of miracle workers, apostles, those that are given some special gift of working miracles. Well, that's not what I'm going to cover, although that would be an interesting subject. I had one smart aleck in the group who said, I know what you're going to do. You're going to be telling us things that not even God has told us. You're going to be speaking on new revelation. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> well, no, I probably wouldn't last very long. The pastor, and rightfully so, would kick me out of here. No, I'm not talking about new revelation. I'm not going to try to speak for God. I'm not going to try to give you some really cool, fascinating, interesting things that even God has not thought of. That's not the approach we're going to make. But the more I got into the subject, the more challenging I found it to be. I found that even though I love a good Bible study where I can pull out the scriptural microscope and really get down into the details of a particular passage, I could not do this with this subject, not could do it at all. I, instead of a microscope, I was going to have to use a wide-angle lens. I was going to have to get a panoramic view. In fact, I realized very quickly to do the subject justice, I was going to have to study the entire Bible, which over this past month, that's basically what I've done. Started in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and went through the entire Bible because I believe the only way I can do justice to the subject is to look at the whole counsel of God, as we're told in Acts 20, 27, or in the volume of the book it is written, as we're told in Hebrews 10, 7, that I did not have the luxury of just looking at small, isolated passages, because if I did that, I could teach anything. For example, I could go to the book of Esther, and I could tell you that God is really silent in the book of Esther. His name is not even mentioned. Now, you knew that, right? So I, if I took the spiritual microscope out, and, and if I decided to just teach on the book of Esther and talk about the silence of God, we could all go out of here. By the time I got done, we'd all be atheists. 
because there is no God mentioned in the book of Esther. Or if I wanted to take my microscope and I really wanted to hone in on the, the Pauline epistles, for example, we could go away believing that based on the sinus of God and based on the Pauline epistles, that he did not believe in the virgin birth because he never mentions it. The Apostle Paul just happens to be silent in his epistles on the doctrine of the virgin birth. So I hope you can see my challenge, my dilemma. I wanted to talk on a subject that was just fraught with all kinds of danger. I could be accused of all kinds of heresy by the time I got done. And that's why I knew I had to really look at the entire Bible from beginning to end and see patterns, see how God operated in history, throughout history, and why he was silent so many times. And so I trust to be a blessing to you tonight. The first session will be a little bit more theological as we look throughout the entire Bible. And then our second session, we're really going to get down to be very practical where you and I live. And so if you've ever have experienced that time where God seemed to be just a little distant, he wasn't so quick to answer your prayer. And I want to make sure you stay for the second session because that's where we're going to get down where we live. But in speaking the silence of God, I realized very quickly, and you'll see in the handout, that there are literally hundreds of verses on the subject. I suppose the first one in the handout that got my attention a few years ago was Isaiah 45, 15. Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read something like that, again, my mind really starts thinking. He is the God who hides himself. You and I want a God who is very visible, don't we? We want a God who is very vocal. If I'm in trouble, if I'm going through a time of trial, I don't want this God who hides himself. And so this verse just, on the very surface, just seems to, in a sense, rub me the wrong way. That's not the kind of God I want to serve. That's not the kind of God I want to live for. That's not the, one of God, the type of God I want to pray to. And so, as I look at that verse to get us started, it just really is fraught with all kinds of meaning that I need to try and understand. David probably experienced the silence of God as much as any individual in the Bible. Psalm 10:1. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Psalm 28, verse 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me. Lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Psalm 44, 24. Wherefore hidest thou thy face? And forgettest our afflictions and our oppression. And then Psalm 83, 1. Keep not thou thy silence, O God. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. And then Job, a passage that probably is familiar to most of us. In chapter 23 and verse 9. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But David was not the only one who experienced the silence of God. Habakkuk. At the very beginning of a book, who needs to learn that great theme of Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith, and he struggles with the silence of God and cries out, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. And so if David experienced that, if Habakkuk experienced that, if Job experienced that, then welcome to the club. If you've come to a place and a time in your life where you've experienced the silence of God, then I trust the messages tonight will be a blessing to you. In our outline, we just want to make a little clarification. Roman number one, the silence of God hermeneutically, big fancy word, simply means how we interpret the word of God. The silence of God hermeneutically. Capital A, clarification. Tonight, I want to make sure that we distinguish between the silence of Scripture, that is, when God simply does not speak to a subject, and when He is personally silent in our lives, that is, when He appears to be distant, or at least He appears to be unresponsive. The Bible is very selective. God is very selective in what He's given to us. To speak on the silence of God, we'd be here all night, we'd be here for all eternity trying to figure out all the things that God did not say. 
God was very selective, and he reminds us of that in John chapter 20 and John chapter 21. When he speaks of Christ, it says, and many other things, or many other signs, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And then John 21, 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So I'm trying tonight to avoid simply speaking on something that God has chosen not to speak on. And that's our challenge with the message in the series tonight on the silence of God. We need to be very careful, capital B, that we don't base any doctrine on the argument from silence. It's real easy to do. We've all done it, and I would say as a preacher, I'm probably just as guilty as anybody else. Let me explain. In chapter 3 of Genesis, we have the account of this discussion between the serpent and Eve. In the course of that discussion, Eve says that we cannot eat of the tree, neither can we touch it, lest we die. And so the question comes up, did God tell Eve and Adam not to touch the fruit, or just were they told not to eat of the fruit? Great question. And the answer is, we really don't know. Now, if God did not tell them to touch it, then you have another dilemma, and that is the fact, if she's lying, then why wasn't that the original sin? Well, probably the answer to that is based on Romans 5.12. There was no command against lying. Now, I know that's hard for us to understand, but Romans 5.12 reminds us, for as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, and that sin is not imputed where there is no law. So technically, there was no law against Eve telling a white lie, so that cannot be then the original sin, because sin is a transgression of the law, but there was no law. We could go on and on with that, and I don't want to get too theological, but the point is we simply do not know. And if you base a major doctrine on whether or not Eve said, thou shalt not touch it, and she was repeating what God had said, or was not, it's really you're wasting your time. We don't know. And usually by the time we get to the next chapter, we really make this very clear. For example, why is Cain held responsible for not giving a blood sacrifice? That just doesn't seem fair, does it? What would your answer be? Well, if you give the traditional answer, you would say what? He was told. It simply was not recorded for us in Scripture because God is not giving us everything we need to know. And again, you would realize very quickly by the time you get to chapters 3 and 4 of Genesis that there are many things that simply God has not chosen to record. Did it not rain before the flood? Great question. The Bible tells us in Genesis 2, 5 that the only reason God watered the ground with the mist of the ground, uh, mist of water, was because there was no man to till the ground. Well, you can assume that once there's a man around to till the ground, Adam's created, that now we'll go ahead and God could bring the rain. But the point is, we just don't know. For years, some creation scientists suggested that our world was like a giant terrarium. But when I talked to John Wickham at the Wilds one year and asked him this question, he said, no, we pretty well threw out that theory. It caused more problems than it solved. And we now believe that, yes, it rained probably right after the six days of creation, and it rained all the time, but God simply did not see fit to give us a weather report until the day of the flood. And then we read about the rain coming down. We find this again, and I, especially with teenagers, this is a very important passage. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, or maybe not teenagers, but we hope a little older, you know, 30, 35, 40, when, when we allow our young people to start dating. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. So let me ask you a question. What does God say about the one who doesn't find a wife? <laughs> 
You could be more blessed, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Why? Because the Bible doesn't tell us about the one who doesn't find a wife. Uh, we could go on. Psalm 127, lo, children are inheritors of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. So then what does the Bible say about the childless couple or the single adult? Nothing. <laughs> so please be silent when God is. And don't come creating something out of the blue. God tells us that that one who finds a wife does obtain God's favor, but tells us nothing about the person who does not. The Bible tells us nothing about the childless couple. The Bible tells us nothing about the single adult. And again, in many cases, they're just as blessed as anybody else. So let's just be careful that we don't base any major doctrine on the argument from silence. All right, number two, Roman number two, the silence of God historically. As I search the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, and this first of all is just historically, it's amazing to me that how patient God is with giving us his word, how patient he is with giving us anything from himself. I mean, I, I'm guessing that if I were trying to put myself in the place of God, as soon as I've got this world created, I'm going to start having somebody write something down. I mean, that's just my, my approach to it, but that's not God's approach at all. He is unbelievably patient. If we go with a creation day of some around 4,000 B.C., and I know that's based on Usher, and again, the creation scientists will allow for a few more thousand years, perhaps up to 10,000 for creation. I'm not going to get into that. All that does, if you extend the beginning of the creation to somewhere around 10,000, then you're left with something like 8,000 years of the silence of God, where he gives us not one verse of scripture. To me, that is amazing. But again, as I study the Bible, I see that seems to be God's pattern. God appears throughout scripture, throughout world history, to be silent most of the time. Which again may just be unfathomable. We talk about the incomprehensibility of God. That's a big fancy word. But he is incomprehensible. Why would he wait 2,000 years, 4,000 years? Why would he wait 8,000 years before giving us even one Bible verse that we can get a hold of and read and get a blessing from? And again, I cannot speak for God, nor am I going to try to, but it does seem to be his pattern. From 2000 B.C. to 1400 B.C., again, he, he gives us the Pentateuch. He gives us the first five books of the Moses. Uh, that's somewhere, we think, probably around the time of the Exodus, 1446 B.C., by some estimates. But again, it is amazing how few people have the Word of God. How much was the Pentateuch even available during those early days? How many people had a copy just pick up your cell phone and there it is? No. You've got the tablets, the two tablets, the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. Other than that, it is just very rare for anybody to be able to access the Word of God. We move on to 1400 B.C. to 1000, the time of David and Solomon and the kings. And again, there are times where God is very silent. David struggles with that in the verses we just read. And Solomon seems to see the blessing of God poured out in very visible ways. And God seems to go back and forth, sometimes visible, sometimes silent, sometimes obvious, sometimes quiet. We then go to 1000 to 400 BC. And again, we see an Elijah and Elisha, boy, they are working miracles and God is visible and God is vocal. And then it's finished by the major and minor prophets that for the most part, are waiting patiently for God to intervene. And then we have the 400 years of silence. That's what it's called, the intertestamental time, from about 400 B.C. to the time of Christ. And again, God seems to be strangely silent. We have very little record. The only one I could find, there is a little verse tucked away in Hebrews 11.35, 
that says women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now, I need to be careful that you understand that I'm about to quote a book of history, not scripture. But 2 Maccabees does give a little bit of information on at least what we think is pretty accurate as far as what was going on during those 400 silent years. And this verse, Hebrews 11.35, seems to refer back to an experience where seven brothers are all executed at the hands of Antiochus Epiphanes because they refuse to eat swine flesh. Amazing, when you think about it, just a pork chop, just maybe a piece of bacon. And yet these seven men give their lives. And again, although it is history, let me just read a little bit for you. The mother was marvelous above all and worthy of honorary memory. For when she saw her seven sons slain within the space of one day, she bare it with good courage because of the hope that she had in the Lord. Yea, she exhorted every one of them in her own language, filled with courageous spirits, and stirring up her womanish thoughts with a manly stomach. She said unto them, I cannot tell you fully how you came into the womb, for I neither gave you breath nor life, neither was it I that formed the members of every one of you, but doubtless the Creator of the world who formed the generation of man and found out the beginning of all things will also of His own mercy give you breath and life again, as ye now regard not your own selves for my law's sake." Or for his law's sake. If that's accurate, and again it is a history and not scripture, but if it is even close to being accurate, here's this woman that had to watch her seven sons execute in front of her face, and then she as well was killed. But her hope was that she would see those sons again, and that's what's referred to, we think, in Hebrews 11.35. So other than one little verse tucked away in the great Hebrews of the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, we really have no evidence at all what's going on for the 400 years called the silent years. And then we come to the present time from the last 2,000 years. There are times in all of our lives where God seems to be strangely silent. That was the cry during the Holocaust. Many Jewish individuals wrote during the time after the Holocaust. They said the big question that everybody was asking in the concentration camps was where is God? We have a particular uh, sign in our house that was given to by one of our daughters that I like, and I've given you the statement here at the bottom. I believe in the sky even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God even when He is silent. And even during the time of the Holocaust, there were those that had to accept the fact that even when God is silent, He has never leaves us nor forsakes us. So let's go quickly to Roman number three, the silence of God biblically. So as I search the scripture from the beginning to end, from Old Testament to New, from Genesis to Revelation, again, I was amazed in so many times God was silent, or at least appeared to be silent, for Bible characters. Uh, Noah, for one, we do not know how often God came to Noah during the 120 years that he's building the ark. We already mentioned Esther, where the name of God is not even found in that book. But then I've given you a little chart here. We'll start with Job. God seems to be more willing to talk to Satan for chapters 1 and 2 of Job than he does to speak for Job or speak to those four friends of Job. And you read through that book, as I have several times in these last few weeks, I'm amazed how God allows Satan to carry out what must have been unbelievable. His children are taken from him. His possessions are taken from him. He has boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And all he has to listen to is these four friends droning on about their ideas about God. Well, you must have done something wrong, Job. Well, if you were really right with God, this wouldn't be happening. God has to chasten you because you're a reprobate. And they go on and on for some 37 chapters before finally God gives them the longest lecture recorded in all of God's Word, four chapters 
Job 38, 39, 40, and 41. And as I read through those four chapters over and again, I thought, you know, the next time I think I've got God all figured out, I'm going to sit down and read through that. And when I'm about to the place where I'm about ready to answer for God, and I've got it all figured out, and this is what God asked, and I've got the answer, and I'm going to explain it all so everybody's got it, then I'm going to go back and read Job 38, 39, 40, and 41, and put myself in my place. Because these individuals, these friends of Job, thought they had it all figured out. And yet Job's attitude was, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. The lesson I learned from Job and so many of these Old Testament characters, as well as new, that when they experienced the silence of God, they accepted it as simply a part of the way God works in our lives. Well, that can be a little disconcerting. But Job seems to accept it. He listens to these friends. God is silent, says nothing. Finally, when God gets around to speaking, he does a great job at explaining why you and I have no right to question him. I think of Abraham. Abraham is told the age of 75, you're going to have a child. In fact, you're going to have children as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. Congratulations. And 10 years go by. Nothing. The silence of God. Well, Abraham decides, well, God, if you're not going to do your part, then I'll certainly have to take matters into my own hands. And so his wife helps him with that idea, and of course you know the story, how he takes Hagar and Ishmael is born. And God comes back and says, no, that's not the way it works. I gave you a promise. I told you you're going to be a father of many nations. You need to learn to accept it. And when I'm silent, when I'm not speaking all the time, when I'm not sharing with you everything you want to hear or doing for you whatever you think I ought to do, well, that's okay because you need to learn the lesson of the silence of God. And so he waits, as you know, age 90, 95, age 99. God says, all right, I'm going to come back to Sarah at the time of life and she's going to conceive. And you know the story. Well, that's like 24 years of silence where Abraham simply tries as best he can to patiently wait for God to do something, to be visible, to be vocal. I look at Joseph. Joseph's pretty impressed by the fact that he was able to interpret a dream as a teenager, and he gets him sold into Egypt by his brothers. And he experiences the silence of God. And while he's there in Egypt, he's trying to become promoted and he becomes an outstanding citizen and a leader in the country, but that's not good enough and he is, finds an immoral woman, Potiphar's wife, seduces him and he refuses and he gets him thrown into prison. And again, God is silent and God does nothing. So he waits patiently until he gets to talking to a couple other of his prison mates and one has a dream, and he interprets that, and no sooner is he told the gentleman what's going to happen is the guy forgets. And again, God is silent. In fact, again, as I see, I see that as a pattern. It almost seems like it's a requirement for the Christian life. And Joseph experiences the silence of God, but he comes to the end of Genesis 50, and he says, but as for me... For as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Then we get to Moses. Well, Moses is a complete change of pace here. Moses, all of a sudden, sees a tremendous visible God. He hears first the angel at the burning bush, and then God himself speaks, and he, he breaks into history. And if ever there is a man in the Old Testament that we would like to be like, it's like a Moses. Yeah, throw down a rod and let it become a serpent. Pick it right up and it comes, becomes a rod. Send ten plagues and destroy the nation of Egypt and have the Red Sea part in front of you. Now there's my kind of God. But what happens? 
it leads to rebellion. They'll say, oh, wait a minute. Now, if God were to appear to me in a visible fashion, if he were to do something in a dynamic way that there is no question that God is doing it, I would fall on my face before him. I would worship him till the day he comes to take me home. And yet we find just the opposite. We find an Abraham who becomes a little impatient, but we have a Joseph who's still trusting in God, but we've got a Moses that has every opportunity to see God at his finest, to see God at his most visible. And he has to lead a bunch of people around the backside of the desert in the wilderness for 40 years. What I saw as I read through Scripture from beginning to end, that what I thought would be true was simply not. That the visible, vocal God who we all want to see in our lives on a daily basis simply does not bring us to a time of faith. It does not increase our faith. It's during the silence where we truly see our faith increased. David, again, struggled probably as many as much as anybody with the fact that God seemed to be so distant. And yet he's called a man after God's own heart. Solomon, on the other hand, saw amazing displays of God's blessing. Gold and silver, chariots out of Egypt, anything he could ever want, showing off to the Queen of Sheba, all that God had blessed him with. What's it do for him? Well, he ultimately marries marries 700 wives and 300 concubines, and they lead him into idolatry. The very thing we think we're desperately seeking from God is to see him work in my life, work in your life, is often just the opposite of what we expect. Elijah and Elisha, significant displays of God's power, all kinds of miracles, And yet the people again reject, they follow idolatry, and they go into captivity. So by the time we get to the major and minor prophets, we have a group of people longing for God to somehow, some way, intervene again. As we come to the ending of Malachi, we've got people desperately seeking God to show himself like he did before like he did for Moses, like he did for Solomon, like he did for others. And so they at least can bring a message of hope to those that desperately are looking for the Messiah. Job went through it, Job 23, 8 to 10, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Psalm 22, 1, we're going to be looking at that as we get to the New Testament. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The cry of David, first of all, but a, but a messianic psalm that will be prayed by Christ on the cross. Habakkuk struggled with this. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Thou art of pure eyes, then to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he, but the just shall live by his faith. I've asked a question that I've really already given to you in in the notes and in our lesson. Where in Scripture is God the most visible and the most vocal? Well, if you've been paying attention, you should already know the answer without looking at the notes. Where in Scripture is God the most visible and the most vocal? I would have to say it's in the Pentateuch. It's in the first five books of the Bible. We see God in all His glory. We see the blessings and the cursings that God places upon His people. A blessing if they'll do right. A curse if they will not. He gives them the cloud of pillar by day and the pillar of fire by night. 
He gives them the direction that they need. Everything that we think we want so much. Now there's how you find God's will. Lord, just give me a pillar, a cloud, by day and a pillar of fire, by night. Now I'm good about following God's will. I can handle that. You know, this, this trying to find God's will and when it doesn't seem to be that clear, what I want is that pillar. I want one in the day and one in the night, and that, that, that's what I want. Be careful what you wish for. Because the ones that had that to lead them and the ones who saw the visible God were the ones that ended up in rebellion, not on their face before a holy God and watching as their faith increased. With remarkable consistency, the Bible's account shows that miracles, dramatic, show-stopping miracles like many of us still long for, simply do not foster deep faith. The three Hebrew children had it right, I believe, before they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Daniel 3, 17 and 18. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, whether God is active or whether God is silent, whether God is visible or whether God is invisible, we're going to trust in him. The lessons we're going to see in the second half tonight clearly remind us that we need to learn the lessons that God has for us in the silence. Capital C, just a New Testament focal point here, and that is one of the most amazing events of all of history. We kind of skipped over the New Testament section. Uh, Let me just go back to that. It's amazing how God speaks so much in the Old Testament and speaks so little in the New. Then let me go on to this focal point. The time in the New Testament that I see God the most silent is the time that to me it's the most shocking. It's the passion of the Christ. It's Christ on the cross. Now God is not one to speak a lot, and of course you could say, well, no, wait a minute, once Christ came to earth, wasn't he speaking for God? Why are you looking for God to speak apart from Christ speaking? Well, because there were a few times where it happened, right? Uh, The baptism of Christ, a voice from heaven is heard, the Spirit descends like a dove, and the voice says, by the way, he doesn't identify himself who he is, but it's pretty obvious when he says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and we can figure out who's speaking. A second time that God speaks in the Gospels is during the Transfiguration. Again, God pulls back the veil from heaven, and again we hear a voice, not identified as God, but again we know it's God because this voice says, again, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye Him. So God speaks at the baptism, waits three years, speaks again, adds three words, hear ye Him. But then at the time, you think, surely God will speak now. This is the focal point of all human history. If God is ever going to speak to us, if ever God is going to speak to this world, He is certainly going to do it at the cross. But the silence of God is deafening. He says absolutely nothing. Not this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. He says nothing. Now I know that most of us have an answer to that, and I guess I've thought the same thing. In fact, I put in the doctrines book, when Christ cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The reason is because he's become sin for us. And when he becomes sin for us, then God has to turn his back. He cannot look on sin. And so God is silent. I thought about that this last week. I've included in the doctrine's book, not once, but actually three different times. Then I tried to find the scripture that I'd used to prove that great doctrine and couldn't find I used any scripture. I guess my thinking was, it's so obvious. Everybody knows that that's what everybody teaches. Why would I even need some verses? And maybe it's not as clear as we think it is. The challenge when we talk about God is that we don't fully understand him. 
And especially when it comes to God and sin. Do you believe, for example, that God is omnipresent? Well, I hope you do. He fills heaven and earth, we're told in Jeremiah. Yeah, he, he fills heaven and earth. He is everywhere present in every part of his being. Not just a part here and a part there. Everything that is God is everywhere. At the foot of the cross, we believe that God was present there. Not just omnipresent, but we also believe in the doctrine of conservation. You know what that is? By Him all things consist. When those soldiers were at the foot of the cross, getting ready to drive the nails into His hands, who was causing their hearts to beat? By Him all things consist. Who allowed their diaphragms to contract so they could take in the life-giving oxygen? God was there, present, because by Him all things consist. The eye coordination that those soldiers needed to drive the nails into the hands and the feet of the Lord. All because by Him all things consist. So when we come to the cross and we try to figure out what does it even mean that God has eyes or that he turns his back. We call those anthropomorphisms. We try to somehow understand God by giving him human characteristics. We're told in John 4, 24 that God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he really technically doesn't have a back or eyes or arms or hands, right? And he's around sin all the time. I mean, how in the world could he go face to face with Satan in Job 1 and 2? or at the temptation of Christ in Matthew 14 or Matthew 4. So on one hand, we struggle with how in the world do we reconcile a God who is holy and pure with the fact that he has to be around sin. He is around sin. Now I know we try to have him turning his back because that again satisfies the fact that Christ has become sin for us. But I was trying to get together some verses to use and I've given you some there. But as I've, I've tried to come up with some of these verses, I realize, you know, am I trying to answer a question that I need to leave alone? When I put in the Bible doctrine's book, and I thought, okay, now, you probably folks, you're wondering what, what the answer is to the question, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, folks, aren't you glad you came tonight? Because I'm going to speak for God, and I'm going to tell you what's going on. I thought, wait a minute. Do any of us have the right to answer that question if God didn't answer it? Think about it. Do you and I have the right to say, I've got it all figured out. When Christ on the cross said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God did not answer it. He did not choose to give us the answer. He did not put it in his word. Who do we think we are? When that thought crossed my mind, that's when I went back to Job 38, 39, 40, and 41. Who do you think you are? Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare, if thou knowest it all. Knowest thou the ordinance of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion there on the earth? Who has not put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath given understanding to the heart? Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? So as I said earlier, do you and I really have the right to answer questions for God when he doesn't answer the question himself? Well, Job learned his lesson because his response in chapter 42, verses 2 to 6, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. All I would say to each of us tonight is I need to be so careful to answer questions for God when he has not seen fit to answer them for himself. 
And I can search the scriptures, and I can find verses here and there, but the bottom line is there is nowhere in scripture that God gives us the answer to the very sobering question of Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In fact, if he is tested in all points as we are, doesn't he need to experience silence when it's not necessarily because we are guilty of sin? And if I answer the question, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And my answer is, well, because Christ was a sinner. Then am I any different than Job's friends? That was their thinking. Job... You know the reason why God has forsaken you? Because you're sinful, you're evil, you've done things that are wrong. And how many times have individuals counseled us when we're going through a tough time? Well, now, brother, now, sister, it just must be something you did wrong. Are we any better than the friends of Job? If we put into the mouth of God things that he simply has never told us, And so as we finish up this first session, I am in awe of a God who is far above me. And when he is silent, I need to let him be silent. And if it happens in my life, well, we're going to talk about that in the next hour. What do I do? What are the lessons God has for me to learn when the silence of God comes into my life? But let's be very cautious and careful, especially as we counsel. It is so easy for us to use the stock line of Job's friends. Well, brother, well, sister, it's your problem. You're a sinner. Get it right. Hit the altar, and then everything will be fine. Well, I think we've seen enough examples in the Old Testament and the New that God is often silent when, oh, no, we're not perfect. But we cannot really think of any major besetting sin still in our lives that would keep him from intervening in our lives. Let's take a break, and we'll come back at 8 o'clock, give you eight minutes.